Well, hello and welcome to this edition of EV Revolution Show. My name is Kenneth Bacor for episode 65. I'm back in the studio. It's been a while since I've been here. Been doing some out and about events, some uh, car reviews and all kinds of stuff. So it's nice to be back in the studio and catch up on some of the news that's going on. So let me get right into it. Um, the first half of the year, how EV sales are going globally. Now, as you folks know, I don't just focus on one specific car vendor or one specific geography or region. I look at the entire EV marketplace as a whole around the world, with the exception of China. I really don't focus on news and reporting much what's going on in China because they are pretty active and that would be a show on its own. But when I'm uh, talking about uh, sales figures and uh, amounts of EVs that are out there, uh, China is included, of course, into that number because it's a big component still of the overall EV push. Uh, now, this coincides with uh, some asks that I got. I had a viewer uh, by the initials MT, and I want to thank you for commenting on YouTube MT. And he asked about, um, you know, if we if if he thinks that we might have hit a plateau on EV adoption until more affordable and fresh models start showing up in the next few years. More, he's thinking about VW's launch and how that's going to help spur things. And uh, the Japanese are lagging and all this kind of stuff. So he asked me to comment, and I said I was going to talk about it on my next show. So his timing was perfect. I want to thank you, MT, for your comment because yeah I had actually scheduled this topic to uh, to be kind of the main thing for this show and you're absolutely correct about your synopsis um, let me just go through some numbers so 2019 global EV sales numbers first half of the year so from January 1st to end of June of 2019 worldwide there were 1,134,000 units that were sold this is probably an approximation but it's pretty close because they do track uh, the source that I use gets different numbers uh, from around the world now, year over year, for the first half, it's a 46% increase over year uh, over the first half of 2018. That's the good news. So that's good. Now, 70. If we look at those numbers, 74% of those were all electric vehicles, and 26% um, of these numbers were plug-in hybrid vehicles. Uh, so as I mentioned, you know, 1.134 million uh, units, uh, good number. Now, how does that compare though over 2018? Well, 2018 globally. Total EV sales were just over two million uh, units, uh, two million and just under, uh, uh, just over eighteen thousand. So two million eighteen thousand and change for twenty eighteen. That was a market share of two point one percent. So we've talked about, and I've talked about the global market, you know, sales being anywhere from eighty eight to ninety three million, depending on how you slice it, and then EVs being a couple million of that. So two point one percent or so is what it factors down to. Now, last year, at the end, of, uh, at the end of last year, or early this year, when these, uh, when 2018 global numbers came out, a lot of analysts were predicting that we would see in 2019 three to three and a half million uh, EVs sold this year. Well, if I look at the first half at 1.134 and I double it, um, that doesn't get me uh, anywhere near three and a half. That gets me about 2.2, almost 2.3 million vehicles. So yes, a bit higher about 250k higher than last year and that's if we equal uh, the first half sales if we double it again uh, for the remainder of the year but certainly nowhere near the three to three and a half million fall sh very very short and as you folks know if you've been watching my shows I've been talking about yes we're going through this hockey stick but I've still been talking that it's going to take a long time and I talked about my tipping point analysis what I consider the tipping point of EVs overtaking ice fee sales Right. When we get to that point, we've certainly hit a tipping point. You know, every the run up to that is great. But until we get a majority of, of vehicle sales that are electrified versus internal combustion, we're still back. Well, still, we're still going uphill. Right. We're having that battle. So my analysis of the tipping point was it's a couple of decades away, you know, at, you know, at least I mean, a decade and a half to two decades away. It's not, even though people are saying oh you know we're doubling we're going to we're at 2% well then we'll go to 4% then we'll go to 8% it doesn't work that way folks uh, maybe in regions and maybe in countries like Norway where they have achieved the tipping point of uh, of of sales of EVs being more than ICE fees in that specific country and region but we have to look at it from a global picture because that's only one area so as you can see then by the numbers that we've had so far in 2019 they're strong they're better than last year but i don't think and and there will be growth over 2018 but it won't be the substantial growth that i think a lot of people are were expecting now uh mt tells me do i think it's plateaued and why what are some of the reasons yeah i think it has plateaued a, a bit now we're still on the upward curve again we're, we're still going to grow this market is going to grow year over year um, again, my, my analysis of doubling the number, it could, 
the second half could exceed the first half numbers, and I hope it does. So it may come up to 2.4 million or 2.5 million. I still think it's going to be short than a lot of the analysts have predicted. But it is going to increase. So that's good. So we haven't really plateaued as far as seeing sales level off. I think we're, we're, we're going to continue to see sales climb. My point is the rate of that climb is what I'm talking about. So I don't think it's going to be as aggressive as a lot of viewers think and a lot of analysts think. Um, you can't just simply do the math. You know, when I go back to Tony Siba, who's talking about, you know, a tipping point well before 2030, he's talking in the next four or five years by 2025. I don't see that happening globally. I see it happening regionally, but not globally. It's a big planet, folks. There's a lot of cars that are moving, you know, 88 to 93 million vehicles uh, and light uh, cars and light vehicles every year globally or at least that's what it was in 2018 so it's a big number and and even if we had everybody cranking out as many evs as they could we wouldn't even get close to penetrating that sales number so we need more choice we need more options we need more people to get into it so what are some of the reasons that i think of some of the slowdowns here why it's not as rapid as people uh, uh, anticipate well i think part of it is incentives some of the incentives are going away. You know, we, we know that some of the manufacturers have hit different clip levels of the U.S. federal tax incentive. And that is a compelling reason to buy an electric vehicle for a lot of people in the U.S. Uh, and I'll tell you why in a sec. And also in Canada, we had our Ontario per, uh, incentive uh, slashed, basically uh, declined or it, it went away when the new government took control last year provincially here. Ontario was actually in a huge upswing of EV adoption until that happened. We, we're still seeing EV adoption, but nowhere near the numbers that we were a year ago. So those are a couple of examples, and I believe that there's probably incentives in other countries that have that are impacting some of the sales. So I believe that that's one reason. And tying that in with the cost of EVs um, as well, I mean, you know, we need the incentives because we don't have cost parity. And I've talked about this on many shows, and I still think cost parity is five to seven years away. Uh, maybe closer to four to six years now, because I've been saying five to seven for quite a while. But you know, regardless of, of that, it's still it's not going to be next year or the year after. I don't think so. I hope so. I wish it would come tomorrow, to be honest with you. But because an EV typically is forty to fifty percent higher than a comparable ICE V car vehicle, it's it's tough for consumers to to swallow that pill. Um, you know, pricing is is a major major barrier to adoption today. Probably the number one barrier, in my opinion. I think some of the others that people um, were considering uh, as far as barriers to adoption, I think they're they're going away. I think a lot of those are, are being uh, over overtaken. But cost is certainly a driving factor, and, you know, and, and affordability. So, you know, you mentioned affordability, MT, in your comments to me on YouTube. Absolutely. We need to get to an affordable state, and we're not there yet because most uh, battery electric vehicles today and plug-in are at the higher end of the automobile spectrum. They are premium. They are SUVs. They are, you know, uh, with the exception of maybe the Soul and, and the, the Kona, you know, I mean, uh, as being smaller type of vehicles and, you know, the Ionic, and there, there are exceptions. But in general, you know, the premium brands have come out with them and they've started with higher priced models. So that's not going to, you know, create the major adoption impact that we need. Uh, because just simply because of affordability, you know, and Tesla is still a premium uh, brand manufacturer. So even though the Model 3 has an entry level price, you know, it's I still I still don't know anybody that paid 35 grand for it. But if somebody has, please send me an email or comment on the YouTube chat on this show and let me know that you've paid 35,000 because I still think that that is a unicorn. But regardless of that, Tesla is still a premium brand, and they can't build enough to satisfy the to impact the markets, uh, you know, as much as we need it to for that double-digit growth or that doubling of growth that people were expecting. That hasn't happened, and I think cost parity is a major stumbling block. And then also there are some battery supply issues with some of the vendors. You know, I've talked about the the Kia and the Kona and uh, you know Hyundai and Kia. Uh, 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 challenges that they have and others that are reporting challenges so uh, you know, we're at a point where we're playing catch-up now or the battery manufacturer industry is playing catch-up with the demand because there was kind of a slow trickle and all of a sudden we get this big uptake and they're going oh and we've got more models now we've got more models coming more choice coming so they need to gear up and partnerships and new ventures are happening and all this kind of collaboration is happening it's going to take a couple of years in my opinion for that to flesh out and steady 
before we start seeing you know a positive impact there it won't it won't dramatically decrease sales in any way it just may hinder again the the adoption and the the increase in sales that a lot of the analysts are talking about so those percentages um, so I think that that's another issue as well and then of course I talked about some of the barriers to adoption and, and a lot of people are still waiting for infrastructure to catch up in a lot of countries in a lot of regions you know here in Canada we're a huge country right if you do the do the Google Canada you'll see we got a lot of land here uh, and there's not a lot of EV chargers compared to the amount of space that we have and even though most of our population are more southern centric uh, you know uh, because of the the, the, the ruggedness of our our um, our geography and our climate still it's we're a pretty vast nation and um, you know there are efforts and as I reported on uh, in new shows and I did the electrify Canada episode last time so things are happening infrastructure is happening so I don't believe that that's I think that's becoming less a barrier to adoption now uh, and you know the other case to that is because there's not a lot of education so you know people like myself that do YouTube shows and others that that talk about EVs and that help educate we still need a lot more, okay? We still need governments, we still need national entities, we still need major programs to get behind this movement and to provide education to consumers. Uh, and, and a lot of the vendors still don't do that, right? You know, I've talked about you walk into, you know, a Toyota or Honda dealership. Um, those are probably good examples. Ford, for sure, you know, um, you want to look at electric, they try to sell you a, a pickup truck or an SUV. I mean, you know, in most cases, there's not a lot of motivation still on that dealer side. So combining all those efforts um, simply is, is a lack of awareness and a lack of knowledge on the consumer to be able to make an informed decision to understand that EVs can work for a lot of people. Um, if you can get over the cost parity hurdle, if you can afford to get into it, they can work for a lot of people's use cases. And getting that information out to people is a challenge. And that's, I think, where society generally, again, I'm, I'm speaking across the board, there are going to be exceptions, there are going to be areas that are doing very well spurring adoption. You know, we have programs like National Drive Electric Week and Plug-in America and all these other organizations, Sierra, all these other groups that are trying to get the message out. But in general, you know, we need, we need major governments to get behind it. We need major initiatives on it and awareness and, and education, not simply just local and regional efforts. Efforts. We need this to go big time. Uh, and I think, you know, the issues with climate change, it's in everybody's election platforms now, uh, depending on what country is uh, is coming up for election, certainly ours. Everybody's talking about climate change. It's one of the highlights, high points of these platforms that we, the, the, that we need to be aware, we need to affect some change. And this is one area that we can, as consumers, affect some positive change there. But, you know, again, we need governments to get behind that. So I believe that a combination of those factors are what, is what, is contributing to the it's not a slowdown in sales because we are increasing in numbers but to the rate of change is slower than anticipated if that makes sense to everybody so it's a long-winded answer to your question i hope that this makes sense um, those are my thoughts about it um, just as an fyi the top 10 models globally uh, tesla model 3 is number one with just under 130,000 units so they're on pace to do 250 to 275 let's say thousand model threes to be shipped this year uh, which will bring tesla's total uh, well into the 350,000 range they might even might squeak out to 400,000. I doubt that as a company, that's a bit of a stretch. Certainly well short of the half a million that they were talking about, but a great increase for them. Uh, number two, a uh, car is a Chinese manufacturer. Um, uh, and then number three, Nissan Leaf. So Nissan Leaf is still, even though sales are slowing, sales have slowed down year over year for the Nissan Leaf, but they're still doing okay, about 35,000 sales globally. So they'll be on the 60 to 70,000 pace, I think, for the Nissan Leaf for this year, which is still going to be good. It's still going to put them at probably by the end of the year, about half a million of these units that are going to be sold that uh, have been sold globally since the introduction of the Leaf, which will still maintain their number one uh, model uh, all you know electric vehicle model single model uh, selling globally status um, but i do see the model three taking that over taking them over relative 
most likely next year in 2020. Uh, but the Nissan Leaf is still holding in there. Then we've got another Chinese manufacturer. Then we've got the Mitsubishi Outlander plug-in hybrid in the number five spot. And that's that's surprising, but not that. It's a great plug-in hybrid vehicle. It's, as I tell people, it's the number one uh, plug-in hybrid globally. Uh, and these are numbers of just uh, about 27, 28,000 units sold globally. So they're on pace to do you know 50,000 or so plus uh, units, which is great for them. Uh, a good all around option for people that don't want to get into all electric vehicles and want to still have that security of some some fuel to keep them going and but with a decent battery range so that they could drive in a lot of cases their daily use in all battery range. And then we've got some another Chinese manufacturer and then, then we have the Renault Zoe. So from, from non-Chinese manufacturers, uh, we've got the first place, the third place, the fifth place and the seventh place are all uh, non-Chinese. All the rest of them are Chinese manufacturers. So it goes to show you that five out of the 10 vehicles, top 10 EVs sold in the world are in China, are Chinese manufacturers. Hopefully these numbers help, gives you a perspective. It doesn't mean that we need to be down. We need to be sad about this. We're not. Again, the market is growing. It's just the rate and the expectation that a lot of people have of this market that I wanted to level set for you. And I wanted to fact find if you want to uh, bring out the truth in the marketplace because there's a lot of fud about that a lot of analysts are, are shouting you know their their predictions and uh, i just wanted to bring some fact to this so it's is the market is doing well but i think because of these contributing factors we are seeing the rate uh, of growth not as high as a lot attributed to but still growth is growth Finally, on the car front, one a little article that just came out this week about Toyota that they're announcing plans to release a RAV4 plug-in hybrid. So those might remember that Toyota did come out with a RAV4 full electric, uh, basically in California only vehicle. They limited uh, run of those a few years ago. Uh, there are still a few of those floating around. I, I know a guy here in Ontario that's got one. Uh, so they do show up outside of California. But Looks like Toyota is finally going to get back into the electrified game a little bit more seriously and at least start in the plug-in hybrid electric route. I don't think that that's a bad idea. The RAV4 is a great SUV, very popular for a compact SUV. They're going to bring this out uh, in the 2021 model year, so we should start seeing some of this um, uh, hit showrooms probably by next summer or next fall of 2020 to make that model year. Uh, the announcements for this and the full reveal will be made at the Los Angeles Car Show Auto Show coming up in November, near the late November at their booth. We want these vehicles to be running on battery only as much as possible. We want people to be charging them overnight at home or, or at uh, different stations uh, because they're smaller batteries. You can you can implement you can use level twos for charging and you know in an hour or two get a full charge in a lot of these cases. So uh, I hope Toyota really comes out with something that's meaningful and uh, wait and see and, and keep your eyes peeled for that auto show announcement coming later on in end of November. And finally, I just wanted to acknowledge some feedback that I received uh, from a viewer. I got a lovely email uh, just a short time ago uh, from a gentleman by the name of uh, Jim. Uh, Jim is in Chicago area in the U.S., Chicago, Illinois. And I I'm just going to read you his email. It's very short, but I just uh, it just really touched me. He says, can I watch uh, from the Chicagoland area? Keep up the good work. Appreciate it. Uh, his family is transitioning over to electric transportation. He's got a 19-year-old that drives a 2013 Volt uh, with a V as in Victor. He's got a 16-year-old as well that drives a, a 2014 Volt, so a couple of Volts in the family. His wife has a 2017 Bolt, so they're obviously GM fans, and they should be. It's good vehicles. Uh, he's hoping for the electric pickup truck to come out very soon. And he says, because of people like you, my family are driving electric. Thank you very much. Well, Jim, I mean that, you know, I responded to you, but and I asked if you'd be okay if I brought this up in the show. You said yes. So I just wanted to thank you very much for that email because that really helps inspire to do what I do, right? You know, I am about the cause. I try to do as much as I can with the limited time and, and, uh, uh, freedoms that I have here to be able to do the, these shows and the efforts that I do and it's you know that's probably the biggest uh, thing that I love to see is when I get people that email me or that talk to me come up to me at public events or when I'm out and about see me and say hey you know you help me get into an electric car and that's that's the biggest thing so thank you very much Jim for sending me this uh, email I appreciate it and I appreciate everybody else who provides feedback because I've, I've have received more than just Jim I just wanted to highlight that and that's great that he's been able to get his entire family into an electrified uh, electrified transportation I guess maybe Jim is still waiting for that electrified pickup truck so he's almost there 
there, but that's great to see. And again, there are use cases for the used EVs out there, especially as secondary or third vehicles in a larger family, uh, older kids that are driving. These are great, uh, great options. Uh, and so, you know, again, that's another market that people can look at. They don't just have to look at the new market. Uh, look at some of the used vehicles that are coming up. The Volts are going to be lots of them out there. Some of the, the earlier Leafs as well, again, for day tripping, uh, just daily chores. They're great vehicles, low maintenance, uh, cheap to operate, that kind of stuff. So uh, thanks, Jim. Appreciate the email. All right, folks, and that's it for this edition of the EV Revolution Show, episode 65. Nowhere near my age, folks, but uh, at least climbing in episode numbers. Thank you very much for watching. As always, I appreciate if you uh, put comments and uh, like and you know put some feedback on YouTube if you like. Please subscribe. It's very important for you to subscribe if you can. Um, that's kind of the biggest thing for me is trying to get my numbers up on YouTube to be able to continue to uh, to know that I'm making a difference and you know my, my subscription rate moves very slowly. So I really appreciate the YouTube subscriptions. Uh, thank you very much for subscribing and please tell people about my show. I get some comments saying, boy, you should have a ton more s subscribers and uh, I appreciate those kind of comments because it really helps me stay motivated and continue to do what I do. You know, I don't have a lot of flash that some of the other shows have. Um, you know, I don't have a shtick that kind of thing i'm more of a kind of just a you know a, keep it a consumer related reporting on what's going on and uh, try to relate things to the average consumer because that's that's where the change is going to happen right it's not going to be one vendor one region all that kind of stuff this is a global movement that has to happen so that's my take on the show and of course i always want to give a humble thanks to my patreon supporters because uh, that is is hugely meaningful to me i would love to see more patreon supporters if you can even a dollar a month or a couple of bucks a month you know just consider a a coffee you know the uh, price of a, of a cup of coffee a month if you'd like to support my show uh, and of course you know don't forget fully charged live uh, first and second February 2020 in Austin Texas I'm definitely going book my flights book my hotel all that stuff uh, here's the code to save 15% on the ticket prices they are selling tickets quite well from what I hear they're adding more stuff to the agenda so stay tuned for announcements coming from the fully charged folks about this show it's only three months away now so it's I'm in pretty close uh, and I'm excited about it. So, and I know a couple of people from this area are going down. They've already uh, messaged me saying, "Hey, I'm going to be going down. We'll see you there." And great, if you are planning to attend, uh, please track me down. I will be there for the entire full time, and uh, uh, I will be visible uh, in some form or fashion at the show. I just won't be roaming around. So, uh, please look me up on that. And again, th thank you very much for watching, taking the time out of your busy schedules to watch me rant about the uh, EV industry and to report some of the uniqueness that and things that are going on. I hope you stay motivated i hope you stay excited about that if you have any questions please don't hesitate to contact me all my contact information is coming up uh, in the next segment there so please uh, stay tuned for that and again until the next show i want everybody please stay safe and i'll see you when i see you and don't forget canadians october 21st is coming please get out and vote it's very important very very important for everybody to vote as much as possible thanks a lot we'll see it i'll see you next time take care bye-bye